Uh oh, what is that?
Welcome to William Slace Live. And today I have a special guest, Jen Belt. We're going to talk about pivoting through a pandemic and also an economic crisis. And without further ado, first, I'd like to say normally what I do is I have this long bio um, about people. But what I decided to do for now one was to go ahead and just have them tell you about themselves. So I'm going to bring her on and we're going to get started. I'm going to fade this music out. I'm going to add her to the stream. Hello, hello. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Let me turn my volume down just a little bit. So you won't get a lot of feedback. All right, so we are ready to begin. Let me make sure we get our names up there and bring up some of the questions. So are you getting ready for uh, Thanksgiving tomorrow? <sighs> all day. Cooking all day today. All day? Yeah. Awesome. I'm doing a lot yeah. of stuff myself, but I'm going to try to take it easy. I got my uh, yeah. son coming in from out of town to visit. So oh, just try to relax and not get stressed. Mm -hmm. So are you nervous? No, I'm not. I'm actually feeling pretty comfortable. All good. Okay, good, good, good. I'm going to go ahead and begin with the first question. Okay, I hear a little bit of uh, echo. I don't know if this, it shouldn't be my computer. I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe it's me. You know, I'm not the techie one. Well, you got your earphones in, so you, you, sh you should only hear me from your uh, headphone, right? That's all I hear. Yep. Yep. Okay. It must just be an artifact. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the first question, if I can all right. That's bring good. the bad boy up. So tell tell our viewers and, your list <laughs> and our listeners, <laughs> what's your story? And I, and I don't want you to be bashful about it either. Oh, my gosh. It's such a loaded question. It really is because um, cause everybody's story can be really down and dirty, but I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it not too down and dirty without being bashful. How's that? that so I bad. am, uh, born and raised in Canton, Ohio. Okay. Is that Canton uh, or Canton? Canton. Canton. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're from the Cleveland area, right? No, Lima. Oh, Lima. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, born and raised in Canton, um, university of Akron graduate. I have a graduate, uh, bachelor's degree in psych. Is there any zips? Yeah. Okay. I'm a zip. Okay. I'm a zip. okay. <laughs> All right. Never went to a single game. I was a commuter. <laughs> <laughs> I went to one game. <laughs> no, I, to one. I, was, I was a commuter. I got married right out of high school. Okay. Um, I was engaged before I graduated. And um, let's see, graduated from the University of Akron, was married right away. Um, about 10 years into the marriage. Uh, started freelancing as an interior decorator. That was my first venture into like the world of self-employment and, and small business ownership. Right. And had um, a friend that was opening a spa in Columbus and started doing work for her. And then as it opened and clients started to come in, they started asking who her decorator was. And so it just kind of like naturally organically turned into this freelance interior decorating business. And I was commuting all the time and the marriage was not good for many years. So okay. um, I kind of saw it as the opportunity to like, hmm, I literally woke up one day and said, I could move down here and start over. So in 2004, that's what I did. Okay. Started over in 2004. Um, those were very lean times. It was really hard for a couple of years. and. Um, ventured into pivoting from that point on until I could, you know, get where I'm at today. But um, yeah, so that's, that's the gist of the story. Sounds really, really interesting. <laughs> Sounds like you got a lot you're going to share with us today. <laughs> and you want, you want to hear something crazy? I originally published this as private and I just now switched it to public. So yeah. that might be why we haven't had anybody watching yet, but just to, uh, keep one thing in mind, it's the, uh, it's a replay that you get most of the viewers from. So oh, I'm, I'm not worried um, about it. It's fine. Okay. All right. It's all good. So what was your biggest challenge yeah. during the recession of 2008? And how can you take those lessons gained during then and apply them to uh, today's uncertain economic times? And this is mainly for the people who are just thinking about starting a business or, or they already have one going and things are seeming pretty difficult for them. Yeah, there's a lot of people trying to pivot now. I get that. Um, in 2006 was when I started Rubio Studio. That was, um, I had a business partner, the two of us, like I was doing the interior decorative, decor, you know, decorative business. 
and one of my clients wanted some faux finishing, some some interior um, decorative painting. And so I found a local um, through a friend of a friend and fell in love with what she did. And so the two of us started an interior decorative business. So that was when Ruby Rose Studio was formed in 2006. And it, it like word of mouth um, and a little bit of, of advertising, it really evolved into this really great business. And um, we were really busy, busy and worked in a lot of really great homes for some really great people and created some amazing spaces. And we were a high ticket item. And in 2008, when the pandemic, or the pandemic, when the economy crashed, um, the housing market crashed, within less than a year and a half, we suddenly were um, cut from people's budgets. People that had huge construction budget budgets and were in the middle of it, and we were part of that plan to begin with, suddenly they just wanted straight interior painting, like all of the decorative finishing, the ceiling finishes and high end you know, cabinet finishes and all of that stuff, like it just went away. And so we had to pivot, we had to reinvent ourselves. And um, for about a year, while we were like building our portfolio and making these giant sample boards, we started toying around with the idea of making art on wooden panels with our layered finishes. And um, a neighbor of my biz partners at the time, she had said, you know, asked him to take a look at it and he loved it. And he was an established artist. And the summer of 2010, um, I had just had my first child. And literally within two weeks, we were invited to a an, our first art festival. And we didn't even have to jury in for it. So um, they had an open spot. Darren knew of some of, of us and said, hey, do you guys have enough inventory that you could like do a show? And we did. And it exploded. And that was when Ruby Rose started making artwork and that making artwork saved our interior business because as the economy got better, um, people that could no longer afford a $5,000 dining room ceiling finish could afford a, you know, $1,000 piece of artwork or a $500 piece of artwork and get the same feel. And then people that would come into our art festivals and see our artwork would suddenly say, Hey, I love that piece of art. I would love to do it on a wall. Do you do that? Yes, we do. So they kind of fed each other and that really saved um, our business. And so when you are in a spot like a pandemic or a market crash or a recession or anything like that, I be open-minded to all of the opportunities that come your way. Be open-minded to um, seeing how you can, you can twist what you're currently doing to fit what to, to meet a need that is out there. And that's, that's what happened in 2008 through 2010. And um, all the way up into 2014 was when we like, that just was a really big part. Like we just did both. And then right. in, in 2015, um, my business partner took a really fabulous job opportunity in St. Louis. And I suddenly found myself being the single owner of Ruby Rose studio and um was not wanting to do interiors anymore. So I had to pivot again and figure out how to make this art business become my sole income from Ruby Rose Studio. And so I introduced a wholesale line. And that was that was years in the making of like making things, trying to figure out something that I could make for shop owners that they mm -hmm. could buy from whole, as a, at a wholesale price to market up, but I could still make that we could still make money. And I really hadn't found that until about 2016 or 2015, I think is when that came about. So that took a lot of hustle to build up the wholesale side. So um, mm -hmm. we, uh, if you don't mind, I want to interrupt you and ask you something that just Thank popped you. up in my mind. Um, when you first started out, were, did you have expectations of this? your business working out overnight or, or were you in a long, in a, well, have a, did you have a mindset of it, you know, being in it for the long haul? Yes, I did have the mindset of being in it for the long haul. And, um, I did, that was, that's definitely something that you have to think of it that way, because if you are in this to get, if you start a new business with the expectation of it happening overnight, um, it's just not going to happen. You have to give something. I kept telling myself and my husband, like, let's just do this for five or six years. If I can grow this to make this amount of income monthly within five to six years, then we're good. If if it's if it's still not evolving and growing, then um, 
then I'll go find a, a regular job job. Um, but that didn't make sense either because I had two little girls at home and for me to go to work in order to pay for childcare just didn't make sense. So in that whole time frame of of struggling to make it work and the feast or famine periods and all of that good stuff. I mean, there were times that I did take jobs. I took, you know, serving jobs. And one time I even, I worked for a couple of years at my kids, um, Primrose at their, um, at their preschool so that I could get their childcare paid for half off because I worked there full time and I worked these early hour mornings and worked my business afterwards. So I could still keep like, you just, you have to be creative. Um, when things get tough, you have to be creative. You have to be open-minded. You have to look at every opportunity and you have to have the mindset that it's going to be okay. If you just stay focused on the fact that it's not working and your bills aren't getting paid, like when you just focus on those things, it just seems to make it worse. So, um, I just always had this thing where I just put, put the things that need worked on, on a list and just focus on doing the work to make it better. Um, okay. yeah. Did you did you have any um did you feel any pressure to <clears throat> excuse me to maybe uh charge less than what you normally would have was there any ins and uh, was there any instances of you uh maybe lowering lowering your prices to break into I guess a particular market or, or audience during those tough times I would find myself um, utilizing sales, my own online sales in times of great need. For instance, right before the holidays when I needed to start buying Christmas presents, um, that type of thing. I was always ready to just like have a big Facebook sale, sell all the inventory 30, like <laughs> dirt, dirt cheap. Um, and, and it, and, and yes, it was lessening the value, but, but it, it met the need. And so I don't ever, um, discourage artists, especially makers from doing that. Like if you need to make fast money, um, if you need to do something quickly so that you don't, you know, so that you can pay your rent or pay the light bill, then do whatever you have to do, but don't make that your long-term thing. Like you have to, um, you have to set, you have to not un undervalue yourself. You have to get paid for the work that you're doing. Don't cut yourself short. One thing I never did was, um, we never, um, priced ourselves so low that we were not getting paid for supplies and labor. Um, but there were times that I was definitely, you know, especially during sales when it's, when it's artwork and it's a handmade item. Yeah. That's just, that just goes with the territory that to host cleaning out the inventory of the, the studio and all that good stuff. But, but there okay. were times like, man, we need, we need money fast. Let's host a sale. Let's, let's sell everything in the studio at 50 to 60% off and get it all out of here and split the cash and be done. Yeah. Absolutely. I've seen, I've seen a lot of online people um, use that same method. Uh, a lot of times they would say tax sale, like, or I owe this much, you know, in taxes. I got to hurry up and sell, sell, sell and get, you know, stuff <laughs> yeah. done. Yeah. 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 Uncle Sam wants his money. We need to have a sale. <laughs> right. Right. All right. The next question is what advice would you give someone right now at this particular time mm -hmm. who wants to start a business? All right. So, two things. Um, Number one, if you are a maker or you are making a handmade product, do your best to do that from home. Do not think that you need to accumulate some type of overhead with a studio space or a storefront or anything like that. Do what you can to sell online and make that, make that product at home. Um, and again, don't price yourself um, don't make your don't don't make sure that you are accounting for the cost of your materials and your labor. A lot of makers get into the habit of pricing things based on what their cost is to purchase the materials, but then they don't forget it. Then they forget about the time that the, the amount of time that they have to make it, the amount of, of work they're putting in to make it. So make sure you're accounting for that when you're working on your prices. And Make sure that you're thinking about wholesale because you never know when a retailer is going to see something that you've made and you need to be able to like offer it to them at that price so that they can mark it up at, at retail prices. So, you know, that's that's a really big thing. The second thing is, is if you are looking for like a side hustle, direct sales gig, MLM, that type of thing, um, be on the lookout for companies that have little to no buy in for a business. Um, that is key because in 2017, that was when my next big pivot came because as a single owner of a bureau studio trying to make just the art run and I wasn't doing interiors anymore, 
um, a side gig fell into my lap. And it was really, it was what was key to me was that it didn't have a biz buy-in and that um, you need to look for, it doesn't have to be a flagship product. It doesn't have to be a ground floor opportunity. It just needs to be something that is practical and that meets the needs of people now, like right now forever. Um, not something extra that people are adding to their budgets because right now during a pandemic, people are not adding anything to their budgets. They are looking to scale back. So um, look for businesses that require zero to little business buy-in that have a really high retention rate of customers reordering. That's a key. And to look for for products that that meet people's needs of where of what they're using now, everyday products. So okay. um, that's key. So uh, one thing people might, uh, when they hear uh, some of the terms that you mentioned, uh, there's in any crowd, in any basket, there's always you know, bad apples. Right. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes e even, even us live streamers and, and there's people who just have negative opinions about us based on maybe what one or two other live streamers have done, you know, dishonestly. So how would you, what would you tell people who may have, I guess, reservations based on a past experience with um, any type of business that requires a, a buy-in and, and I, myself, I just want to say this before you answer, I, myself, mm -hmm don't think that it's a bad thing to have to have some skin in the game because um, without that pressure, it doesn't, per you, I don't think most of us have the motivation to take the next step and keep going, especially, you know, when times get difficult, but what would you tell someone who's a little hesitant to um, take advantage of uh, an opportunity like that? Follow your gut. I mean, look into the company, follow your gut. It depends on how much skin are they talking about and how much does it affect your bottom line of where you are now? If you're having trouble um, making your light bill and feeding your babies, then absolutely a $500 buy-in is not a good idea. So follow your gut, look into the company, look into... Um, look into all of it. And just, I mean, that's one of my main things is, is always is follow your intuition, follow your gut. And sometimes it's wrong. Like I am totally a person that, that, that fell for, I, I went into a wine company that had a $500 buy-in. It had a really crappy wow. binary comp plan. It was awful. Um, but I was excited about it. And I knew that and I like wine. So I was like, I could totally do this. If I can make money selling, if I can make money drinking wine, then I can, I can totally do a company like this. But it just it 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 showed its true colors very quickly. It's not even in business anymore. Um, so just pay attention to those things. Just be smart about it. Be smart about what the buy-in is. How does it fit into your current budget? Um, there are companies out there that have zero buy-in. There are companies out there that have that require you know except you know you just being a customer. The company I work with is a is a referral you know a customer referral setup. Like it's it's really like. It's amazing. So just find something that fits your lifestyle that you know that it, that you can feel comfortable with a product that has an actual product, that it has an actual product that's that people actually need. That's in the customer retention rate. Like that's that's really big. Ask those questions. If the person that you are talking to can't tell you what the percentage of customers that reorder every month, um, if they can't tell you what that number is, then you should be leery of it because mm -hmm. I mean, the retention rate is what builds residual income period. So right, right. don't want to have to turn and burn every single month and work your butt off over Thanksgiving, trying to, trying to enroll new customers. That's just not how it should be. So you want to, you know, spend your day making Thanksgiving dinner like I did all day. So. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> My next question is, uh, what are your favorite, are your favorite tools? tools? <laughs> or resources you use to help run your business more efficiently. And I, I guess I wanted to be a little bit more specific. Okay. Um, could you tell us some of your online resources that you use and maybe some of your offline resources that you use? Oh my gosh. This is such a funny question. Cause I've been thinking about it all day when you presented these to me, I was like, Hmm. Okay. Online re Like I am old school. I am a, I am a notebook and binder and uh, maybe it has something to do with being an artist. Like everything is pen to paper for me. Um, I utilize um, alarms on my phone to remind myself of appointments when they go on my calendar. Um, I don't, I'm just, I'm not that tech person. I love technology. I love Facebook. I love social media. I love Instagram. Um, Facebook is kind of like where my, where my personality is. That's where I build the most relationships. Um, 
That's probably my number one online tool that I use. I use a lot of Zoom. I do a lot of Zoom meetings um, with my organization, with my teams, with my customers. Um, I, but as in terms of like, you know, I like to use, you know, funnels or email, like my, my business, my art business. Yes, I have an email system. Um, I have a, a lead generation with all of that. Uh, but in terms of like, building my business and building relationships in my customer base, it's, it's, it's all still pen to paper. Like I am literally, I don't use Trello. I don't use spreadsheets. Wow. Yeah. My, my artist brain has an aversion to spreadsheets. Like Microsoft Excel makes me want to rip my hair out. Um, <laughs> it does. And I have to use it with my Girl Scout, uh, with my Girl Scout troop and like our cookie like programs when we're doing cookie stuff. Holy mm -hmm. cow. When that Microsoft spreadsheet comes out, I'm just like, I just want to rip all my hair out. I can't stand it. So I can't yeah. stand spreadsheets. So here's either. my so here's my here's my business right here. This is my current binder. <laughs> you know, uh, some people might find that funny, but I've actually, I guess, experienced and also read before I experienced. I tried it out. When you use pen and paper, there's there's supposedly a, a better neural connection that's made yes. Yes. Um, versus when you're uh, you know, looking at a screen, even just reading a book and, and, and I love the smells, smell of books. It's weird. Yeah. I just love the smell and feel, but there's supposed to be an advantage to doing that. So I don't, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's that bad of an idea. I, just, I think it's actually well, better. I totally agree because if I write something down physically with pen to paper or pencil to paper or whatever, right. if I remember it, I retain it much more quickly than I do even putting it in my phone, um, with a reminder or I'll put notes, you know, I have a whole note section in right. certain apps, you know, on my, I've ever note on my phone. I can't find anything in it, but I make notes all the time, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't remember any of it. I I the same it. My phone. Right. But, but notes. my notebook has it all right here. <laughs> right. And uh, you know what, that, now that you mentioned that I use notes on my phone and, um, I guess a bad thing that I need to change and probably right now, my passwords to all the tools that I have online. <laughs> And some people say you should make it all the same one, but that's scary because that's if they totally get scary. one, yeah, they have yeah. access to everything. Everything. But... No, that's not that's not advisable. I don't think that's a good idea. And then when you change phones, it's like right. the the process right. of move things over isn't all, always smooth. So I always crack up because I I have I have lots of of I have so many different passwords, but I have them all written down. Like right. I know that the big thing is cybersecurity. So God forbid anybody were to actually break into my house. They would like, if they just were to get through my messy desk, they might actually find all the access. So <laughs> because again, I have to write it all down. Oh my gosh. Can you hear my dogs? I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you're fine. You're, you're <laughs> fine. This is real life folks. This is, this is live it streaming. Is. So it is. <laughs> If you ever hop on a Zoom with me, you never know what you're oh, going to hear. Man. This year has brought so many weird challenges that I think, you know, mm -hmm. humanity as a whole has, has uh, I guess, overcome. But the process, the journey going through it, I mean, uh, my, my job since March, we've been working from home and we had those meetings at least once a month. And at first it was like, yay, we get to work at home. Then it was like, oh, my goodness, not being around people, this isolation, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought I would actually 100 percent like it. Mm -hmm. but, but then we keep having these zooms and um, my, uh, Apple has a really neat commercial for yeah. working from home It is the funniest thing, but there's just so it. many funny things that happen. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, um, so I, since I've been working from home forever um, right. and typically I'm used to like sending husband and sending kids off to school. And so like the house is quiet and it's just me. Mm -hmm. So nothing for me has changed except that right. I've got all these extra bodies here asking me questions all day long. And so like I, and like hearing, I had no idea that my husband took all of his work calls on speakerphone. Thank God we set him up in the dining room way right. from my <laughs> office. So I'm like, why, why is that up so loud? And why are you telling <laughs> those people? Like is that, if the people at your office been listening to that for 20 years. So um, yeah, it's, it's just, I've had to, I probably had the biggest adjustment of having everybody here, and but we've actually loved it. We, we've loved all being home and, you know, it's, it's working. It's fine. So. Okay. Sarah Rollins <laughs> says, this is good info. Thank you, Sarah. I, I really appreciate that. And I do feel that she's given us some, uh, some gems. There's so many things that I could follow up with, you know, <laughs> okay. in another show, especially that, um, the thing you mentioned, 
uh, you know, working from home and charging, you know, an appropriate price because there was a time when I was making soap <laughs> and, you know, you measure all your materials and stuff and that, that yeah. has a certain cost. And then, you know, you see all these other people selling it for a certain price. And then you think, okay, all these resources you can get back. But the one thing that I can't get back is my time. Your time. How, mm -hmm. how much can I realistically mm -hmm. charge, you know, of my time? How much for my time can I charge and still, you know, have a market that, that will buy? Yes. You know, yeah. it's a legitimate question. And, and honestly, I'm not opposed to makers asking themselves, how much am I willing to work for per hour? So um, like, for instance, when I came out with my first wholesale line, it was called the Wildwoods. It's, it's, it's a 12 by 12 silver tree on a colored background. And those are my most popular, most ordered thing. And I, I'm in like 16 different stores around the country. And when I was working out the price point for those, um, I had to like think in my mind, like, okay, I'm going to make 12 of these at a time. So I'm going to, my husband made, I had all the material prices uh, sorted out, but then I was like, okay, let's say I make 12 of these at a time. Cause that's going to be like my minimum order for a store to order. And so I had to time it. Like I was going to time, like all, how many, how long does it take to do this step on all 12? That has to dry overnight. That part doesn't count. Then I go back downstairs and I have to do the next step. Next step, how much? And I would just write it all down. And I'm like, okay, so I have this amount of time invested in these twelve pieces. So how much do I want to get paid for that hour? What is what does my hourly rate need to be in order for me to be able to make a living, a viable living wage as an artist? Um, but it, and it was still difficult because I would, you have seasons as a maker where, you know, all of the stores are wanting to buy in September and October to build up for the holiday season. And then they're not ordering again until like April or May for the, for the summer season. And then they're ordering again in September. But then, so what I would do is then I would do shows in the summer and sell my own work. And that was quite the hustle. And thank God I have the biz I do now that saved my art biz. Um, right. because I was making like, I would have like two shows back to back. I would do like 10 art shows in the summer and some of them would be back to back weekends. So I was making like 50 to hundred pieces of inventory art, whipping them out, hoping wow. that they would dry and cure to pack in the van, to drive to Indiana <laughs> to do for an art festival or two that I had back to back. So it was just a lot of stress. It was a lot of fun. Like I have absolutely no regrets. Um, it was a lot of work and I'm almost 50 years old. So I'm really happy to not have to do that anymore. And now I can just make art because I want to. I make art for my wholesale stores, my, my you know, my shops that buy from me. And I make art um, for commissions. Like most of my, the majority of the work I do now is for people that are ordering. So I'm only making artwork for people that are actually ordering it which okay. fills the need to make, make the art. And then occasionally I, I make pieces that are just for fun. And then I throw them up on Facebook and somebody buys it. So, but I no longer do I have to do that whole scrambling to make 50 pieces of artwork. For <laughs> double, double showed month. Like, it's just crazy. <laughs> I know I didn't mention this before, but this is a question, you know, based on some of the things you've said, I'd like to ask you, have you ever considered teaching or maybe creating a course on either how to create specific types of art or how to run a business as a creator or maker. Have you ever considered that I or have you done it? say that, yes, because about five or six years ago, I started what I thought, because I have mentored a lot of artists through the years. And because um, they just reach out naturally. How do I start a website? How do I get this? How do I start doing shows? How do I create a portfolio to get juried into, you know, fine art festivals. Like I, I would just mentor artists naturally. And so I started um, a little side hustle called Ambitious Artisans. And it was kind of a coaching service to help artists get started. And I totally threw it out the window after two years, because what I realized is, is that artists are a pain in the ass to work with, because they are <laughs> just not business minded. I am, I am apparently there's not a whole lot of artists that actually know how to like apply for, you know, they would get so overwhelmed with applying for a vendor's license, a $14 piece of paper with the state that they live in. They would get overwhelmed with it, just the smallest little things. And 
and they weren't very self-motivated and I am. And so right. it frustrated me to have them as a client to coach them. So I threw it out the window and I was like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore, but I am just going to continue to mentor any of them that show up and ask me questions. I am asking questions. So if you're an artist and you got questions, just reach out to me. I will totally answer your questions. Free of charge. And, and folks, <laughs> later on, we're going to um, give you her contact information so you can do just that. <laughs> uh, she's going to say it. I'm going to put it up on the screen. All right. Next question. Tell us the reason you even decided to go into business for yourself. Well, and I don't want to say this. It's it's like cliche-ish. It, it, it I get goosebumps saying what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it. <clears throat> what is your why? <laughs> 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 what is your why? Uh, man? What is your why? And actually, that's a really big part of it. <laughs> that I'm in. We are very big on the why. Um, so why I went into business for myself back in 2004 was simply out of necessity because I had to pay my bills when I was leaving the first husband. Right. right. Oh my gosh. You're fine. You're, you're fine. <laughs> oh, man. She's go she's getting her dog. <laughs> I'm going to take her out camera until she comes back. And I think she is back. I'm going to bring I her back on. Okay. <laughs> My time is I have a hunting dog in her house. It's she's the last. What kind of dog is that? Um, is a hunting dog? What kind of dog? She, is she is a um, an English pointer and a German short hair pointer mix. Yeah, I'm so, about to look those up. Oh yeah, a leaf falls to the ground and she is ready to kill it. So, um, is this a big yeah. breed or a small breed? breed? Medium, medium. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So my why, so be necessity, like I had to pay my bills when I was leaving the first husband. So that was when it started, but I was willing to like take, you know, I was, I did serving for a while, like just trying to get that business off the ground. My why now is, is honestly, because that little side gig um, referral business hustle became my main hustle and it saved my art biz. That is now um, my why is to retire my husband. So he is eligible to retire within the next couple of years from the state. And um, our girls are 10 and 11 years old. So we didn't really think that that was gonna be possible with them being this young, but I think that, I think he could actually, I think he could actually retire when he's available with the way things are going. So that is my why, my official why. That's a really good why. I think that's something mm -hmm. that, um would help push you or help you keep going, you know, on your journey when things become inconvenient or, or difficult or when there's obstacles put in front of you. So yeah, if anybody's yeah. listening or watching this, you know, at least write down what your why is so you can Absolutely. look at it and remind yourself, you know, yeah. Yeah. Every day. And I always, it, it's, and it's so true. Like the, the whole cliche thing of like, it's not if life happens, but when, um, which is why it's important to have a plan B and to be open-minded to pivoting your business at any moment. Right. Um, because I mean, even in 2018, my father-in-law's health, like put Jim in the farm field and having to like learn how to harvest crops and he was in and out of the hospital and our lives got put on hold and my art business got put on hold, but the sales gig like kept us afloat. So, um, like life happens. And so having a plan B and being able to pivot and being open and just learning to go with the flow and not freak out. It's just so mindset is everything. And it's so funny because I have like on my, the, the cliche dream board. I love having a dream board. And one of my, I put my why up there operation, um, bring daddy home. And then as Aww. of March, and then as of March, <laughs> he's home, he's working from home. And who knows if he's even going to go back to the office before this is all said and done. And he retires because of the pandemic. So, you know, oh, so he's home because of the pandemic too. Right. Right. Oh, but okay. I put it on my dream board two years Bring ago and, and now he's home. So it's like, yeah. you know, operation being daddy home. You never know how it's going to happen. You he don't. Home. You just got to be open and receptive. Now, <laughs> does he help you with the business? Does he help you with your businesses that he's you have? A, a little bit, not too much. Um, A little bit. He will, he wants to more, but there's a little bit of a conflict of interest with the company, okay. with the, with the state that he works with. So he can't, he can't be too involved. So, yeah. I was looking, my eyesight's failing me. I was looking at my name and it looks like I thought I had like three L's in the middle or something. <laughs> I haven't done this. I haven't done the interviewing thing in so long, but I, you know, I'm, I'm listening to what's his name? Earl Nightingale's lead the field. And yeah. he won a concept that he meant. And it's like a three hour over three hour um, 
audio book. I'm listening to it on YouTube. And one of the things he says, he talks about, that's why he said this. You have diamonds right where you're at. Meanwhile, you're looking at all these other places. And one concept that he said was the job that you're doing right now, mm-hmm. more than likely you, you are there for a reason mm-hmm. and you should look at what you do and how you can do that in other areas. And what I do all day mm-hmm. is I speak to people, mm-hmm. get information and document it for them to help benefit them. You know, mm-hmm. like it's, it's, it's Medicaid is what it is. And um, I love speaking to people. I've always loved speaking to people. But when you add something more than my my work phone, the laptop, when you add all of this stuff, it gets <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> You're like, you and I are doing the same thing I do every day, except I'm on a camera with all of this equipment and this fancy sound system right here. Right, right. And um, it's it's the same thing. It's taking what you do well and getting paid to do it in another way. Like, right. I mean, that's 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 what pivoting is. It's like, okay, what am I good at? What am I doing? This right now is hurting over here because of things out of my control. So how can I pivot it and, and change it to, to meet a need and still be doing what I love, which is what I had to do with art businesses. And, and, it, right. and it evolved into like the sales gig too, because I've always like been able, and it all comes back to having a psych degree. Like I'm not using my psych degree, but I am. Yeah, like, that's what I, that's <laughs> but I am like, that's I'm not working in the field, but yet through interior decorate, decorating, I was able to ask the right questions to help people express what's in their brain and help me bring it to life. And with their art commissions, I'm able to like ask them the right questions and say, okay, so when you say pink, what do you, you know, I help people through the questioning process, helping them through the interview process. And then it just e- evolved then into art festivals and helping people understand like, okay, so you're talking about your, your sofa. Is it a standard sofa? Do you think the size, you know, it just moves into sales and then it moves into online sales. So it's just constantly evolving to where I am now, but it all, it's every single job I've ever had has led me to where I'm at. So there's absolutely no regrets of anything, like anything. So every single job, every single job has led me to where I'm at right now. Even though, even though while you, you yeah, had that job, you, you made... <laughs> breakfast place I worked at. <laughs> uh, who is, there, there's something I'm about to ask you. Um, I should have wrote it down. Oh, oh yeah. Real quickly. Um, you mentioned dream board. So is this an actual physical board that you have? And do you make those? I don't make those. Mine uh, was a, um, I never even thought about that. I could totally make those, but really you don't, you don't need to pay for one of those. Here's what it is. It's okay. a bulletin board that I painted white. I got it at a garage sale for $2. I painted it white. This one's huge. It's probably two and a half by five feet or three feet by five feet. It's huge. Um, and it's just a bulletin board. And I literally cut out things and I write things down and I'll post a picture of it in the comments. Like it's just a mess of layers of things, and I just okay. pit, push pin them, push pin them on there. Yep. Awesome. Sounds like sounds similar to like maybe a, you ever heard of a storyboard? Yes, okay. it is similar to a storyboard. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. How would you, uh, I'm sorry? What are some myths or false beliefs you'd like to debunk about running a business business in general, and also running a business that's very similar to yours. What type of myths would you like to debunk? Uh, number one is that because I work from home, I am available to do all the things at any time from home. For instance, being called upon to like, I don't know, hey, honey, can you go and look in this file for this thing? And I'm like, no, I'm getting ready to start a business call. Um, the 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 idea that just because I work from home doesn't mean I have a schedule doesn't mean that I'm not working like an eight to five schedule. Um, however, I do make my own schedule, so I can schedule things in. But I am pretty scheduled and pretty regimented. Um, also, I had something else written down for that. Um, I can't remember. Oh, that it's not hard. It is hard. It's totally hard work. Like it's not something that's going to happen overnight that you have to be consistent. You have to be, um, you have to be, you have to be self-motivating 
and figure out how to have that mindset to actually wake up and do the things, even when you don't feel like doing the things, period. Like it's not not easy. It's not. Absolutely. How do you feel? Well, I just said this. Back in March is when we were, you know, stayed to work from home, told to stay at home and work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of us are in our, you know, our our pajamas or whatever, just, you know, working and stuff like that. And you feel different than what you did because it's it's a semi semi casual business. You know, the attire that we wear is semi casual, maybe some khakis, polo shirts, sweater, whatever. And then you come to this and it's like, um, it's so comfortable. But at the same time, I had a sense that the what I was wearing pajamas was kind of affecting my, I don't know how how shall we say, motivation yeah. slightly. Yeah. And there were, but there were a couple of days where I said I'm going to dress, you know, where. Oh, where'd you go? I'm here. I hit a button, and I. Okay. <laughs> um, so you're going to change your dress. You're going to get motivated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, w- w- would you advise people who work from home to keep a, a particular attire? I or- think- I think it depends on you. If if you need to do that in order to get the things done, if you need to wake up in the morning and take a shower and put on your face and wear a pair of jeans instead of pajama bottoms, then do it. I personally have been working in pajamas for the past 15 years in okay. my home. Like that's just how I roll or paint pants or whatever, but that's my job. So um, like it, it's not, it it just depends on you. There is no right way and wrong way to run your own business. There's only your way. And if right. something's not working for you, then change it. If exactly. something is working, don't think you need to go change it. If something's working, stick to it. If it ain't broke. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't fix it. <laughs> okay. If you were interviewing yourself right now. Uh-huh. Are there any questions that I didn't ask you during this live stream that you would ask yourself? What? Why do you think? What are the what what do you think it takes to be successful? I think I would ask myself that because that's important. And we touched on it before. It takes consistency. Like even when it's boring. You have to have the tenacity to want to work even when you don't want to, and you have to do it consistently. And that can mean, and you can still set your own schedule. If that means you're only working three days a week because those are the three days you don't have your children and the other two you do, so that's a no work day, then so be it. But do it every, those three days, every single week, day in and day out, even when you don't feel like it. Um, Having tenacity, being consistent, and um and going with the flow just being be having an open mind and being willing to just pivot as things happen like pandemics like you just have to you can't i the people that i see struggle the most are the people that are really really like frustrated that everything has changed yeah and it is so frustrating not to minimize that it is so frustrating it really really is but right. um in order to take care of yourself and your family, you got to take a deep breath and go, okay, I can't control this. So what can I control? What can I do? Where can I look? What is available? What is open? What can, what can I make? What can I do? What can I, um, what opportunities are available? Like you just, you have to be willing to bend. You don't have to break, just bend. I think about 90% of the things that we worry about happening usually don't happen, Mm -hmm. maybe 95, but then Mm -hmm. what's left, I think you can split that in half into two categories of one category is, is, are things that we really don't have any control over and the next category are things that we can, you know, work through. So Mm -hmm. for some reason, our mind worries about so much more. It it does. And when you're a parent, it's become it's so bizarre. Oh, like your brain goes to the worst case scenario all the time. I remember <laughs> when my firstborn was born and I and I am not a worrier. I'm the hippie child that doesn't care about anything. And then I became a mother and I asked my mom and I was like, When am I going to stop worrying about Stevie dying in her sleep? And she's like, You won't. It's here forever. I like know. it's just part of your life. 
Like you will forever worry about your child dying. Forever. I love my, and I was I love like, my second time around. I have a 13 year old. And every time I walk upstairs, I look in his room. Sometimes I go in and I touch his head, but he's 13. It never goes away. <laughs> yeah it's bizarre i mean it's All just right. yeah mm -hmm. okay how can our viewers and listeners get in contact with you and what i'm going to do when you tell them this i'm going to go ahead and flash a, a a banner on top hopefully we still can hear you i'm gonna make sure that <laughs> all right could you go ahead and tell them yep you i my facebook is an open link so send me a friend request that is the majority of where i you will meet me and get to know me and build a relationship with me you can facebook messenger me you can check out my artwork at ruby rose studio you can email me at jen at ruby rose studio.com if you ever want to get in contact with me about absolutely anything you can also see my artwork on facebook um, Ruby Rose Studio. I'm also on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn, but I haven't done anything there in a while. But feel free to hop over there if that's your jam. So, um, yeah. So just find me. Find me. Connect with me. I'm here. I'm an, I'm open. All right, folks. I flash that up on the screen. It has all our information there. It has a way to contact there uh, through Facebook Messenger. We even have our Instagram link on there. And uh, there's a phone number down at the bottom. So, I'll flash it one more time. As a matter of fact, even better, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that information in the comments. If that's, if that's okay with you, Jen. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. And now we're going to put you in a hot seat and ask you my favorite question. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. If you could go back in time and sit down and have a conversation with an 18-year-old you, what would you say to them? Mm. The floor is yours. I would say, Jen, spend more time with your dad. You got less time than what you think you do. I would spend time with my dad. So if your Man. parents are alive and you love them, go spend time with them. Because my dad was gone 12 years later. And oh. I would have known that I was 18. I would have like totally, yeah, I miss him. Is your mother still alive? Yes, she is. And I tell her I love her and, call, and talk to her. I should call her more. Mom, I'm going to call you when I get off of here. If you're yeah, watching. call her when you get off of here. I, I, both of mine are gone. And it's like, I, it's kind of like you feel like an orphan. Yeah. You know? But, yeah. I'm sorry. All right. Wow. That was, uh, that really hit, <laughs> hit my heartstrings. <laughs> Everybody. Man, Just call your mom if you can and your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the things that Jen had to share with us. Um, if you have any comments when you watch the replay, be sure to uh, leave them in the replay, the comment section. I'm going to leave her information in the comment area and uh, get in contact with her. I'm sure there's um, some things that you can ask her. She says she'll talk to you for free. Absolutely. In addition to that, she makes uh, it looks like she makes some really great artistic products. And she may in the future, she just may, we're going to try and encourage her to do it. She may end up offering a course to teach you how to do some of the things she does. Maybe. <laughs> oh, comment. Maybe. All right. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, watching. And I am going to end the show. You take care of yourself, Jen, and stay in contact. All right. Thanks for having me. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.